Welcome back to Crime After Crime. I'm John Lorden. And it's me, Danielle Hallen. All right, you guys. It's the month. It's the month that I've been waiting for for two years now, okay? Mm -hmm. Are you coming to meet us at CrimeCon in Las Vegas on April 29th through May 1st? If not, don't worry. It's not too late. You can still use code crime after crime. Get 10% off your standard pass. Come and meet us along with many more of your favorite true crimers in person. It's going to be a blast. I wasn't able to go last year. We weren't able to go the year before. If you don't come, I may cry. And then John has <laughs> and then John has to deal with that. And I can't handle it. I can't, can't. handle it. I need your guys' <laughs> help. Please come to Vegas. We're gonna have a good time. We're gonna have stuff to give you guys, all mm-hmm. kinds of goodies. Please come and enjoy meeting us in person it's it's a lot of fun i like hanging out with danielle too it's yeah, fun sometimes yeah. <laughs> that yeah. didn't sound too confident <laughs> i kind of like it it's all right <laughs> i don't want to hear it you always have me sitting for like three hours signing things i know i put her to work guys i really do yeah well we don't yeah. ever get to be with each other in person so you know we got to get yeah. all these things done at one time i'll never forget though <laughs> uh like the first time uh, that we were at CrimeCon together and we would go and like have lunch or go and have drinks and stuff like oh, that. Yeah. Like, those are really good memories. I really, it I was really, great. I All the Starbucks that. runs, giant yeah. Starbucks drinks. Absolutely. Oh, I'm still thinking about those avocado tacos. Mm, the fried oh, avocado yes. tacos. <laughs> yeah. John's like, I remember. <laughs> they had good sushi there too. There was a mm-hmm. bunch of good stuff at that place. Oh yeah. Uh, vegan sushi for me. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Well, we got to get right to it because we've got a big episode. I've got mm-hmm. a giant story to tell. And uh, I know Danielle's got a good story to tell, but uh, I'm just going to put it out there. I'm going to, I'm going to make you work for it today, Danielle. All right. I'm pretty proud. I'm pretty Scaring proud of my the story. competition over here. <laughs> but before is, we get to that. This is considered intimidation. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Well, let's see what happened with last episode first. How about that? Okay. Last episode was ridiculous ransoms. Danielle told the story of the abduction of Charlie Chaplin's coffin with Charlie still in it. And I told the story of a young man who threatened, who was threatened with being burned and even fed to an alligator by his captors if his family didn't pay up the giant ransom fee of $800. How did it play out, Danielle? What happened? All right, you guys, on the website poll, I received 49% of the votes and John received 51% of the votes. Hand over the mug, hand it over. And then on Twitter. What? I received 52% of the votes. What? And you received 48%. Well, well, okay. No, now, here's the thing, though. I, I know the numbers as they come in. And okay. Twitter doesn't usually get as many voters as the website poll. Mm-hmm. I think we have to go to individual votes. So we've compiled all those together. What happened, Daniel? All right. So once we put all of the individual votes together, I received 286 votes. And John received... 286 votes. <laughs> no joke. You guys, this is the first time that has ever happened. If there's one of you ever. out there that's like, I should have voted last month, you should have. You would you have made a difference. It. Yeah, you would have picked the winner, essentially. We have never seen this happen. Never. We, the, the closest thing we had was at the end of season one, we did a recap and like mm-hmm. a tally, and we had to go to the votes in that case as well. But we didn't have this problem. Yeah, so, but the single vote counts did, you know, bring out a winner. But <laughs> this is absolutely wild. Yeah. Um, I guess, Danielle, that means technically we are both winners. I appreciate uh, that. I think yeah. this is great. Yeah. <laughs> and be- we'll because of that. this every, every episode from now on. Well, yeah, this is our goal for every episode. <laughs> and honestly, it is a good sign. I mean, it means that both of our stories were were at it. They were both they were great. top tier. So, yeah. Um, Danielle, you have the cup from last time, so uh, I, I think you need to give me whatever well, you have over there. It's what? not technically the cup. I have. No, that's it's not. gone missing again. I can't. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Okay, you can take just hand this. that over. All okay. right, now pull back. Oh. Now pull back. There we go. Okay. All Perfect. right, you keep that one. I'll okay. keep the crime after crime mug over here for now. Mm-hmm. And Danielle, if you need yeah. another one, let me know. We'll order you another one. Look, it's somewhere. Okay. 
<laughs> it's somewhere. It is. I know it is. Well, this is the problem with, you know, doing these not at my own home. You know, I go yeah. to film oh, somewhere yeah. else and then all of a yeah. sudden I've forgotten half of everything I need. It's just, yeah. it is what it is. <laughs> I just love that we had an episode mm -hmm. about ridiculous ransoms and mm -hmm. it came out with a ridiculous outcome. It was yeah. just double was ridiculous. Yep. And I love it. Perfection. Today, we are looking into crimes for fame. Do mm -hmm. some people become famous for being criminals? I'm looking at you inventing, Anna. Do some people commit mm. crimes Ooh. to become famous? Do already famous people commit crimes? All these questions. The Oxford Dictionary describes fame as the state of being known or talked about by many people, especially on account of notable achievements, but the achievements to, always aren't yeah. so good. They could be notable and not good. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just make that clear real quick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and today we're looking for stories where crime and fame converge. And we're getting it started with a case told by the amazing and talented Danielle Hallen. I've got my Thanks. cup. Building me up after you tried to intimidate me. <laughs> <laughs> so... Mm -hmm. Iowa State University. A quick Google search will tell you it's the largest and most popular university in the state of Iowa. <laughs> I had Hence to add the that. name. Hence I the know. Name. It's, it's very notable. I had to. I had to add it in there. That really is what it says, like the first line. <laughs> <laughs> but it is also in the top 50 for best business schools. It's one of the nation's most student centered universities with over 100 bachelor's degree, degree programs, 112 master's programs. 83 PhD programs and over 800 clubs to choose from. Okay, they've got a lot going on there. Sounds great. But with all of that brain power that's being expended on a regular basis, it should also come as no surprise that students at the school are also known for their ability to have a good time. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and with that much college debauchery going on, someone came up with a brilliant idea to capture and profit off of it all. Okay. That someone is 27-year-old Rossi Larothio Adams II. Okay. Long name. It's okay. Better known around campus as Polo. I don't know how on earth that connects, but... We'll take it. Adams attended Iowa State University in 2015, where he firsthand witnessed some of the wild behavior that students managed to get themselves into. After capturing a few very risque moments on his own social media accounts, he came up with this idea. Everyone loves to be nosy. Don't even try to tell me you're not. This is why social media has exploded the way that it has. I'm just going to lay that out there. Mm -hmm. So when you pair the unquenchable thirst for consuming social media content with the desire to be the center of social media content, mix that in with college students after hours, this man hit the jackpot, essentially. Yeah. I'm ready so to Adam's, subscribe. That's you're all. like, I'm. well, <laughs> you, might, you might change your mind in just a minute. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So Adams came up with the idea of a social media company known as State Snaps. It was the best way to stay on top of the most outrageous happenings around campus. Have FOMO because you had to stay in and study? Don't worry, all you have to do is hop on Snapchat, you get free entertainment, feel like you're right in the middle of one of the parties. The social media account consistently posted photos and videos that included, quote, incredibly crude behavior, drunkenness, nudity, and more. I'm so ready to subscribe. You're like, I no, you're not changing my mind. <laughs> State Snaps deemed itself the authority on partying, college life, and having fun. For three years, the account remained strong. Adams was mainly operating it on Snapchat. Obvious reasons. There's a time limit to the posts there. You know, mm. it's a sneaky, sneaky 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 app but he did post some of the content to the state snaps instagram and twitter pages but because he couldn't capture all that was happening around the campus by himself and during peak times for you know college debauchery like spring break his fellow students started to keep an eye out for him capturing anything they could to send in and be posted it was like a modern day adult rated gossip girl essentially sure <laughs> The videos would pour in with hopes of landing a spot on state snaps. New students would find out about this entertaining page and it even began this challenge, at least I call it a challenge. So the slogan, do it for state, which was sometimes shortened to diffs, began to ring out at every party, encouraging party goers to do the absolute most for a chance to be featured. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we're You're starting to like, slide great. off the tracks here, yeah. <laughs> You're like, I don't know if I want to follow this anymore. 
So as you could imagine, this account ruffled many feathers around campus. So a lot of the concerns centered around consent. So with the level of intoxication that many of the subjects in the video were at, mm. uh, paired with the lewd acts they were usually participating in, it was a legal battle waiting to happen. On top of that, when you're faced with a group of drunk friends screaming, do it for state, you know, there's a huge chance that someone could take things too far on the name of 15 seconds of fame. Yeah. Stunts were being performed like some bootleg Johnny Knoxville with everyone crossing their fingers, no one got hurt. Drugs were used multiple times and posted on these different pages, which added in, you know, beautiful little sprinkle of criminal activity. So the Iowa State University administrator was finally made aware of this page from very concerned staff, even concerned students who either had somehow gotten themselves wrapped up in something they didn't want posted or there's honestly no telling. And he unsuccessfully attempted to shut the accounts down. Now, Adams ignored all objections from the school, continued on his adventure. I don't even think he received any complaints from the actual sites themselves. Was he and still he, attending? Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, he even managed to snag a few interviews on the local news where he bragged about his accounts, his amount of followers, and how he refused to back down, that he was just showing college life in its rawest form and all of that. He was a local celebrity. People loved it. This People eat this kind of thing up. Like, this is so entertaining to them. Mm -hmm. And by this point, State Snaps had grown to over 1.5 million followers across all accounts. There were spinoff accounts that were made to target more specific groups. For example, Do It For State Girls. You can let your mind wander on that one. Mm -hmm. Adams felt invincible. He was known and loved all over campus, and he wanted to continue to grow. He saw this as a business opportunity that didn't have to just be at this school, but it could grow even further than that. So he managed to snag the domain name Do It For State with the number four, but found that Do It For State all spelled out was already taken by a man from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Okay. But Adams felt entitled to this domain. Did he trademark it? I mean, if he trademarked the original name, he might have some legs to try to get the domain. Or if, I mean, if he trademarked the business yeah. name. Nope. Okay. He had built a legacy for himself under the slogan, do it for state. So he began to reach out consistently to the owner of the domain mm -hmm. from 2015 to 2017 repeated attempts. Now he hoped to simply buy the domain name off of the owner, but the owner had absolutely no desire whatsoever to sell it. It was actually creating issues with their company because the names are so, you know, pretty much the exact same. And they were having to publicly stand up and say that there was no affiliation between yeah. them and all of the insanity going on on these social media pages. They had to say they were against the content that was being posted. And then finally, after two years of this attempt, the domain holder did finally offer to sell it for $20,000. <laughs> you know, for for a, a name that's in demand, that's not that's not completely crazy. And if Adams the guy is that thought successful, it was crazy. well, <laughs> he did. Yeah. He thought that was absolutely wild. I don't think he wanted to part from a penny of the money he was making off of it. Yeah. So as the page and the expectations grew, the desire for more fame and glory from it began to cloud Adam's mind, and he became even more set on getting this domain name no matter what that meant. So in May of 2017, Adam showed up at the home of the domain holder. No. Yes. So this guy's brother actually was the one to answer and open the door and saw Adam standing there. He was very proudly wearing his shirt, boldly lettered with state snaps on it. He had one of his fists clenched in his hand, ready for business. Adams directly told this guy that he was there to take the domain name. He was willing to do whatever it took to get it, and he would not be leaving without it. Now, this caused a little bit of a standoff, but ultimately, Adam did in fact leave without the domain. <laughs> he was very quickly shut down, but not without a new plan and one that involved a lot more force. Adams reached out to his cousin, 43-year-old Sherman Hopkins Jr., who was living in a homeless shelter at the time. He had his own felony history to deal with. He had multiple previous charges of assault, perjury, drunk driving, domestic abuse. Not a good situation. 
obviously though, the first person that you would pick if you want to get something taken care of. Yeah. So yeah. they created a plan together. I'm sure he promised Sherman some sort of money to get him out of a situation, to get him to agree to it. However, that's never been stated anywhere. Uh, but they were going to demand the domain name by breaking into the domain owner's home and threatening him. What the heck? Mm -hmm. But of course, Adams didn't want to be the one doing the dirty work. After all, he had a very successful social media presence to uphold. So on June 21st, 2017, a month after the first incident where he showed up unannounced, Adams picked up Sherman and they headed to Cedar Rapids. Sherman had been given a demand note that was written by Adams. It had instructions listing out exactly what was expected of the domain owner and how to transfer the ownership to Adams' GoDaddy account. He was also given a stolen gun and a taser and basically was sent in to, you know, do the dirty work. So upon arriving, Sherman made his way into the domain holder's home. I'm not sure exactly how he got in there, uh, okay. but he did attempt to hide his identity by wearing dark sunglasses, pantyhose over his head and a hat. So obviously this made a lot of noise. The domain holder runs there and you can imagine how he's <laughs> feeling looking down his stairs to see this pantyhosed man mm -hmm. at the bottom screaming profanities at him. So he attempted to get away. He ran directly into one of the rooms down the hall, locked the door. He said that he was pushing all of his weight against it to make sure Sherman couldn't enter. But Sherman did eventually manage to kick the door open anyways. He pistol whipped the man Ooh. and then I know and then grabbed him by the arm and was like, take me straight to your computer right now. So with a gun to this domain holder's head and also for some reason repeatedly tasing him you're kind of making it difficult for him to get to his computer. Wow. But he ended up going to his office, um, opened and pulled up his laptop. Sherman then handed him the note that had been written by Adams and repeatedly told him that he better be doing it right and following all the directions. So he ordered him to log onto his computer, watched as he transferred the domain name over to Adams. And then according to records, he stated, if you go to the police to tell anyone about this, I'll be back for you. However, despite the domain holder doing exactly what had been asked of him, Sherman became increasingly more violent, which given his history, yeah, yeah, not too surprised about that. And at this point, the domain holder had had enough of sitting there with a cocked gun to his head. So in a brave, quick movement, he went to slap the gun away and a scuffle began. So during the tussle, the domain owner ended up getting shot in the leg. Ugh. But despite this injury, he managed to wrestle the gun away from Sherman and shot him multiple times in the chest. Now, it did not kill him, Ooh, man! but it gave him a minute to call for help. Yeah. At this point, Adams fled. He said, all right, <laughs> bye. This is why I sent someone else in there. And when authorities arrived, they were able to transfer the men to the hospital for treatment and Sherman was arrested. Now, Obviously did not take very long for them to figure out exactly what was going on. There were records already of Adams repeatedly contacting the domain holder. The domain holder's brother had even spoken to him at one point. So less than a month later in early August, Adams was arrested right along with his cousin Sherman. So Sherman was ultimately found guilty in June uh, of 2018 of one count of interference with commerce by threats of violence. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Now, he did apologize to the victim and his own family in court, but those apologies were falling on moot ears. The domain yeah. holder ended up testifying against him, obviously, and he was like, I can no longer relax in my own home out of fear. He was attempting to heal from an injury in his leg, but mentally he just wasn't sure if he would ever get over the attack. And the U.S. District Judge, Lynn Reed, was pissed <laughs> and pointed out how absolutely senseless and brutal the attack was. And could not believe that it was all done in the name of social media and social media fame and followers and just absolutely wild. Adams was facing the same charges. He was in fact found guilty on April 18th, 2019. He received a sentence though that was lesser than Sherman's. He only received 14 years, but he did have to pay 9,000 in restitution, including, I believe, $1,477 straight to the victim, which honestly could have been worse originally. He was looking at a maximum of 20 years and a $250,000 fine. Yeah. So I feel like he kind of got off easy there. 
Now, even while Adam's trial was ongoing, things were still being posted to state snap social media. But nobody would say who was operating the sites during that time. Clearly, like, it didn't matter that he had, you know, just tried to forcibly get a man to transfer the domain, went in with a weapon. No, he had to keep that social media account running because if he didn't, he felt like he lost everything. Um, Now, ultimately, state snaps, it all disappeared. All the accounts, Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter were alerted. They deemed that they violated the terms of service. And so all that was taken down. And this is a prime example of fame going to your head. And like I said, I feel like he honestly got off really easy, seeing as many people could have likely charged him for posting some of the snaps alone. Yeah, You know, without their permission, there was a lot of nudity. And he even bragged in one of his interviews, he was like, nudity sells, like sex sells and all these things. And I feel like this is also a good reminder that social media is not a freebie zone, which I feel like so many people have this like false idea in their head that it is yeah that what they say and do in regards to social media and how they step their way up a ladder to fame doesn't matter but it absolutely does and it's definitely not worth going to prison over like ever the second you consider harming someone and breaking into someone's home over a number of followers a there's home, a problem yeah a home invasion <laughs> yep to get a domain name like it just it's insane and if you would just sit for a second and think about that original offer yeah of twenty thousand dollars and if you really are successful enough hey your your nudity is selling you're Mm -hmm. you're you're monetizing this content on multiple different platforms even if that twenty thousand dollars was a year of your income why not go that way about it? Why not do it the right way? Why not try to cut the guy in? Hey, you know, if you give me the domain name, we're going to give you a 5%, you know, interest in the company. Or There were so many different ways to approach that. But instead, it's like he wanted to become a gangster or like go Al Capone on the situation. Yep. Like, it's just so, it's well, so I, disappointing. I think the success kind of surprised him. Yeah. Just from like the different things that I've read, you know, he kind of came up with this random idea that he's not the first person to think of something like this. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Granted, it's not gone wild. I mean, exactly. Yeah. You know, I feel like every town has like a photographer that goes out on the weekends and like takes pictures of everyone being drunk and crazy (laughs) and like posts it. Mm -hmm. And it's like a thing to go and look at it. It's like this wasn't any groundbreaking idea. But I think he was just kind of shocked that he got it to work and he was able to, you know, build a name off of it and he was getting interviewed and i just think that you know he didn't want to give up an inch of what he got at well, all and, and and probably from his perspective it was probably some big next step yeah that was either going to secure that yeah. fame and keep it coming for mm-hmm. the in, into the future or propel him to the next version of because exactly. quite honestly like who cares about a domain name? Like domains, they're not that, yes, they're kind of important, but you can make and brand your domain name to whichever way you want. Like you don't, exactly. you know, you don't have to have it 100% tied in. And, you know, like Twitter uh, has a character limit on the username there. Sometimes mm-hmm. you're not going to be able to use the same name from one place to the next, like yeah. to get so caught up on, I need that particular name. Like yeah. there's, there's something to try to wrong. propel yourself forward and get more and more and more. You know what I mean? It was. Yeah. 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 There's something wrong. And That's, that you're willing uh, to hurt someone over it. Oh, good grief. Yeah. What's, I mean, do you know what his uh, major was? I did not. I wasn't able to find much information yeah. on that. Yeah. It's just, it's a bummer that, um, you'd think about someone that's getting an advanced education like that. Exactly. Exactly. And mm-hmm. they would, they would go down that road. It's really yeah. sad, like really yep. disappointing. Makes you think mm-hmm. about like, what are the things that we're we're teaching, you know, our, our our young people through the school systems? And I mean, do we need to have a mandatory class when you're a freshman in college that is like, you know, decency in the social media space? Yes, I genuinely think that we do. Honestly, <laughs> like it's it's ridiculous. And you know, having children myself and seeing them grow up with social media in a way that I didn't, it is the amount of conversations that have to be had just because there's such a false reality being displayed on social media and it it just gives, I don't know, it's like what I was saying about how it's not a freebie zone, but people feel like they can get on social media, say and do what they want 
as long as it gets them to their end goal of more likes, more numbers, more fame, more notoriety, all of that, and people are willing to push the limits, we see it time and time again of people being willing to do whatever it takes in order to get to that end goal for themselves. And I feel like we really need to smack into the heads of everyone like, look, people can say what they want and do what they want on there. That does not make it real. It does not mean you are allowed to do whatever you feel like. It's just, it's wild. It's so easy to get wrapped up in that mindset that I feel like it ends up like transferring over to their reality directly in front of them. Yeah. Yeah. And it's strange because being a kid that grew up in California, like, Mm -hmm. you know, fame is such a big thing. Like being in Southern California, uh, you know, everyone's an actor, everyone Mm -hmm. you're talking to. I I knew people that were extremely successful. Like I I was working at 20th Century Fox and working in the legal departments. I knew lawyers that were making tons of money and still working on a spec script for a a TV show or something. Like, I mean, Mm -hmm. it was, it was just a thing where, it's it goes beyond money for some people it's they just want to be able to say i was part of this i was part Mm -hmm. of that did you see me on this screen did you see me on that screen and honestly there's a part of me that's keyed for that too i mean that's that's part of why i started playing in the youtube space and you know playing with content and trying to figure out what my message was going to be but um boundaries (laughs) and you know and understanding them and limits and well and that's there's an unfortunate other aspect going on here where his popularity uh outgrew the lessons that he had learned exactly like you know i wasn't perfect on in social media when i got started but no one was watching (laughs) but no one was watching exactly so it didn't matter like i was able to kind of learn and have small conversations (laughs) you know get feedback (laughs) from like john (laughs) yeah like one or two people and develop myself and grow and like oh okay that thing that was really grabby for attention that's yeah probably not the best way to go about it and um yeah if if success comes too quick i think it just you know you don't learn those things exactly and it's so easy entering social media and this idea of fame through social media to see what other people are doing and make assumptions on what's acceptable for you to do yes and that's not how it that's it looks different than it probably actually is and so it again it just All of it is that rides, I'm sure, all the way up to the top. I mean, Mm -hmm. not just social media, but through major media, through television, through film. Uh, Yeah, that's perceptions, perceptions. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow. Yep, and a huge thank you. Yeah, big lessons. Yeah, I had to do something on social media. I knew it. I was like, oh, I originally wanted to find something on TikTok. I was like, I have to do it because I kept Mm. stumbling across these stories where people would do crazy things to create TikTok videos to get famous, but it was like harming individuals, like people beating other people up or stealing this or stealing that. And yeah, I'm like, since when has it become acceptable <laughs> to, you know, like, and people are treating it like a challenge, like the amount of challenges that have been banned on TikTok. Right, right. Like slap your teacher, whatever that was. I'm like, y'all have all lost your mind. Slap your <laughs> said, teacher. What yeah, the? they had to, I'm serious. It was like a thing, a challenge on TikTok going around making people viral it was crazy i don't like it so i had to talk about it yeah this is like the inner mom in me i've already had conversations with my kids i'm like no we're talking about this i'm glad you brought it up because i do i think that's such a good example i think it's a great story to to help teach some of those lessons out there so yeah i'm really i'm proud that we're sharing something like Mm -hmm. that here today Yep. And a huge thank you to the New York Post, Des Moines Register, Forbes, Vice, Washington Post, the Gazette and justice.gov for all the information on this story lot to think about with that one. We'll be back right after this short break. With a life full of meeting with producers, photograph sessions, and running from the paparazzi, I can really work up an appetite. When my personal chef isn't around, I bring in the next best thing. That's HelloFresh. Paparazzi, John, (laughs) a personal chef. Hey, we're not just talking about YouTuber money here, Danielle. Television film, book signings. You don't have a book, John. That's because I was spending too much time in grocery stores and measuring ingredients. HelloFresh has changed all that, Danielle. I get farm fresh produce and easy to make recipes sent right to my door. So the movie is coming soon then? Well, not yet. I have to write the book to sell as a movie. And before that, I have to get in shape so that I can shoot the book cover. 
which will be easy with HelloFresh's fit and wholesome recipes. They have six recipes per week to choose from that include low calorie and carb conscious options, like the amazing Mexi Cauli Rice Stuffed Poblanos with Southwestern spices, fresh tomato, guacamole, Monterey Jack, and a dollop of zesty crema. Muy bueno. Muy bueno, Daniel. <laughs> Go to HelloFresh.com slash Crime After Crime 16 and use code Crime After Crime 16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. That's right. Tell your personal assistant to go to hellofresh.com slash crime after crime 16 and use code crime after crime 16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. You don't have a personal assistant, John. Well, you know, that comes with the filming of the movie, Danielle. It's all a process. It's all worked okay. out. Talk yeah, to well, my people. Nah. Yeah. Try America's number one meal kit right now. All right, you guys. Welcome back. I'm interested to see what John's story was. I know mine was a little bit deeper, gave you a little yeah. something to think about. So I'm interested to see how John switches things up here. Um, well, you know, I tend to sometimes want to go historical. I think it's interesting that you wanted to go with kind of internet age. Yeah. I'm going just a hair before that. Okay. But the story is the bomb. You ready? Oh, man. Okay. I'm ready. Hampton, Virginia, 1994. On Tuesday, September 13th, an employee at the Hampton District General Court building went into a restroom and was shocked to find a pipe bomb. The courthouse was immediately evacuated and the experts were brought in. 41-year-old trooper Vernon Roy Richards and his two-and-a-half-year-old black Labrador retriever named Blaster Master, which I think is is really cool because Blaster Master, <laughs> that was a Nintendo game back in the day too. Um, That's great. <laughs> they arrive on scene and they start their search of the 60,000 square foot facility. Blaster Master is taught to sit twice when he detects an explosive. And he did quite a bit of sitting that day. In all, three explosive devices were found. One was a cardboard tube bomb in a towel dispenser. Two others were pipe mines. One pipe mine was filled with nails with their heads snipped off, turning them Ooh. into deadly shrapnel for the blast. Yeah, these are serious, serious That's devices. Rough. Yeah. Trooper Richards was also taking this case a bit personally. His wife, Kathy, worked in that very same building. Quote, this was the most stressful situation I've ever been in, he would later say. The courthouse was shut down for nine hours in total. The building suffered minor damage as the bombs were intentionally detonated, but thankfully no one was hurt. Trooper Richards and Blaster Master gave an all clear at the end of a hard day. They had a great track record with Trooper Richards holding 73 accommodations for police work. Together, they also found bombs at two local area malls within the previous year. In one of those cases, a bomb threat was called in the mall evacuated over 3,000 people, and Trooper Richards and Blaster Master got to work finding the explosive before anyone could be harmed. But who would want to bomb the courthouse? The following day, a bomb threat for the same location was called in. Oh, geez. Trooper Richards and Blaster Master got back to work. However, that day, no explosive was located. Was someone playing games with the police department? Might that be a sign of their age, Danielle? Mm-hmm. Richards would continue the investigation. On September 15th, he conducted a traffic stop on a 19-year-old African-American high school senior that lived only two doors away from the courthouse named Eric Lee. Behind a speaker in his car, Trooper Richards found a four-inch cardboard tube. Actually, it's, it's a little different. Uh, there was another officer that was with Trooper Richards, and I think Trooper mm -hmm. Richards suggested, hey, look behind there. And the officer found yeah. a four-inch cardboard okay. tube. The same type of tube was used in one of the bombs found in the courthouse. So they detained Lee. And then two dozen officers, including Trooper Richards and with Blaster Master, went to Eric's home. They were they arrived shortly after midnight. His mother answered the door to, you know, two dozen law enforcement officers there wondering what the heck's going on. They asked to search the home. She agreed to it. They didn't find anything in the home. So they sent Trooper Richards and Blaster Master to work. They started searching the outside of the home. 
In Eric's yard, Trooper Richards and Blaster Master found a film canister containing gunpowder and nail shavings, which were used in that mm -hmm. bomb that we were describing yeah. at the courthouse. It seems that Richards had found his man and Eric Lee was taken in for questioning. Trooper Richards, who had been on the force for 14 years, 10 of those with the K-9 unit, told the press, I feel safer doing this than I do working a simple traffic stop. Walking up to a car, not knowing what's going to happen, I trust my dog's ability to tell me if something is there. And Blaster Master, he's a good little bomb sniffer, Danielle. Yes, he is. He is. <laughs> In an article by the Daily Press titled An Officer and His Master, it detailed the story of the crime-fighting duo, saying they emerged as heroes from the wings of routine police duty. Eric Lee was questioned by police for 12 hours. He maintained his innocence the entire time, specifically saying that cardboard tube found in his car had been planted. They gave him a lie detector test. He passes it. Mm. Eric wasn't charged with anything and was released. It seems that something was wrong with the investigation. One investigator, Corporal Ken Seals, was puzzled at that find of the film canister. It seems that Eric's front yard was completely soaked in dew when they were searching it, but the plastic film container had some black powder also on the outside of it, and it was totally dry when it was collected mm. for evidence by Corporal Seals. So... You had this 19-year-old. catch there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, seriously, how observant. Like, like really for him. good catch. <laughs> if he would have missed that in the moment, like you just, you would mm -hmm. never have even thought twice about it. You had this 19-year-old with physical evidence popping up around him, but he claims it was planted. He passes a lie detector. And this canister makes it look like maybe it could have actually been planted. So Virginia State Police did something you don't hear of often. They had to run a sting to see if their worst fear was true, and one of their own was a criminal. Oh, no. So they secretly set up a storage shed with a hidden camera in it. Then they called in Trooper Richards and Blaster Master, saying that they suspected that there could be explosives in there, but they knew that there wasn't any. The camera caught Trooper Richards placing primer caps, which are used in some explosives, in one of the boxes. He then came out and claimed that he found the items in there. On September 27th, Richards was arrested. He was held without bond and immediately suspended from the force. Uh, Blaster Master was transported to state police headquarters where he would be trained to work with a new handler. Quote, this is one of the darkest days in the 62-year history of the state police, said Colonel M. Wayne Huggins. We, more than anyone else, are saddened and embarrassed by the investigation's results. Eric Lee had something to say about this as well. It's not just what he did to me. He endangered my family. Yeah. Remember, Danielle, his mother had two dozen officers all of a sudden show up after midnight. Yep. She agreed. She said, quote, I've been in a nightmare. We were just victims for somebody else to put his crimes on. Now that Trooper Richards was found to be a fraud, it started raising questions about his other fines. Yeah. Invest investigators accused Richards of placing an artillery simulator, a device used in police training to mimic a bomb blast, in the Coliseum Mall and manufacturing a bomb and taking it to the Lynn Haven Mall in Virginia Beach. So those two mall finds from before? Yeah. Ronald Tarrington, an agent with the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, stated they were hazardous and could have caused serious injury or death. Of course, Richards and his dog were involved in both searches at both locations. He was charged with five counts of possessing and manufacturing explosive devices and three counts of attempting to burn or destroy a courthouse. He was facing a possible sentence of 70 years in prison and several hundred thousand dollars in fines. Actually, the total on that would come out to be almost $1.2 million oh in fines gosh. that he was facing. Yeah. Uh, so that following November, Richard's lawyer requested a psychiatric evaluation of his client to determine his state of mind at the time of the offenses and whether Richard's was even competent to stand trial. He was deemed competent and the trial would continue. In January of 1995, Richard wound, Richard's wound up pleading guilty to now seven felony counts of attempting to bomb buildings in four locations, the Hampton General District Court Building, the Coliseum Mall, the Lynn Haven Mall, and the Richmond Coliseum. 
Back in June of 1994, he planted an explosive device at the Richmond Coliseum while he was making a sweep prior to an appearance there by black activist Louis Farrakhan. Richmond Coliseum can hold over 13,000 people. Farrakhan was convinced the bomb was placed there to deter people from coming to his appearance. However, 7,000 still wound up attending. Good grief. Isn't this, it's, it's a downhill slide with this story, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's just terrible. It's terrible uh, to think that someone would risk other people's lives like that to propel himself in this way. Um, U.S. District Judge Rebecca Beach Smith denied bond for Richards, despite hearing arguments that he had actually devised the bombs not to explode and that he was doing it to improve his reputation. One story actually supports this. In a third mall bomb occurrence, Richards obtained an old military grenade and rearmed it. He then planted it in the Coliseum Mall, same mall that he made one of the discoveries at. He was assuming that he and Blaster Master would be called to the scene. But guess what? They weren't. Oh my gosh. Are you serious? A janitor found the grenade and accidentally triggered the device. Thankfully, it did not explode. Since he didn't get called to the mall on that one, he would wind up planting a pipe bomb there in the same mall several months later that he and Blaster Master would find. Oh, dang, that didn't work and I got lucky. Let me try it again. Yeah, yeah. So ultimately, no injuries were reported in any of the incidents attributed to Richard's explosives. However, I don't think we can say no injuries resulted from his actions. Five years later, Eric Lee would say in an article, I still have nightmares. It's affected my whole family's life. Uh, he also kicked off a couple of lawsuits around that. I don't know how far they went. They didn't really report on those much. Vernon Roy Richards received nine years in federal prison with no parole for each count. That would be 63 years in total. However, they're to be served concurrently or all at the same time. There was some yeah. law that they had to be served concurrently. So that's why it's only nine years to, in total. Mm -hmm. um, but because he had so many different counts, that's what kind of knocked out the parole because you couldn't basically give him parole for one of the counts and then he'd yeah. have eight more. Uh, he was also placed on three years of, of supervised probation and had to perform 150 hours of community service when he was released. They said that they were going to try to focus that community service on restoring the public's trust of the police department. I don't know what that would be for him. Like, <laughs> you're not going to trot him around as a great That's example of that. That's what I was about that, to say. I don't think that was a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, the judge did not issue any fines or court costs, so that big... 1.175 million mm -hmm. uh, basically the judge decided that would just put hardship on the richards family who are also victims in this the way that the judge saw it and yeah it was kind of interesting because in some of the articles they were talking about when he was in court and stuff like that he wouldn't even look at his family so he's probably ashamed of what he had done yeah you know and yeah. when you have families like that especially in law enforcement i feel like there's a huge feeling like sense of pride, pride. and yeah yeah absolutely Jeez. during sentencing the judge told richards it is clear that you never intended to hurt anyone but the potential was there and the court has to consider that potential while you never intended to hurt anybody there were repercussions that did hurt somebody and i think she was pretty much talking about eric eric lee stated I feel like he didn't get enough time. If it had been me, I know I would have gotten more time than he did. His mother stated, I don't think Roy Richards would have wanted this done to his son. No. That's a really good point. Reportedly, Vernon Roy Richards was seeking stature to improve his reputation, more pay, and was hoping that with these big accomplishments, he would actually get pulled out of that regular duty and become an instructor so he and his wife could move to a nicer home in the country. In an article titled, Lure of Fame Can Lead to Criminal Acts, which detailed Richard's case, mm -hmm. several psychologists and criminologists concluded that being a hero was a motivating factor in this case and others like it, where even nurses might inject patients to create a sickness, then become heroes because they're the first to notice and help rectify the issue. Or 
firefighters that start the fires that they first oh, recognize geez. and then yeah. extinguish. I ran into that a lot, like next to this story. Um, and even in that article, they talked about that this happens with firefighters very well, more commonly, I won't say very commonly, more commonly than it does with police officers. It's actually kind of surprising to me though, because there is such an imminent danger there. Like that's mm -hmm. a huge risk. That to me just shows completely uncaring. Just yeah. hoping it goes their way. I remember one story, um, I think it was from Glendale, California, if I remember mm -hmm. right. And they kind of pieced together that there was this one firefighter um, that was at the scene every single time like he was the first on the scene and they were starting mm -hmm. I they think caught he on it. yeah yeah he might have been a chief even if i remember right but oh yeah um here's another quote from that article there is a need for glory and fame stated ronald weiner a criminology professor the experts also state that generally the people that do this have very low self-esteem lead mundane lives and live in a fantasy world where being in the limelight and getting accolades is their main preoccupation yeah the story of Vernon Roy Richards would make news everywhere, including the best publication ever, the Weekly World News, with an article written about him on the same page as a piece that claims the dinosaurs wiped themselves out by playing chicken. <laughs> <laughs> in On that same page, in the lower right-hand corner, this little tiny blurb is this article titled, from hero to zero, mm -hmm. and it's about him. Master Blaster was retrained and assigned a new handler and then spent his days in Culpeper in Northern Virginia doing the work that he loved. Good, I feel like he was betrayed. And that's just not me saying that yes. as a, like an animal person, but I mean, that dog is dedicating his whole life to doing this and you are going to use that. That's I was so even worried. Up. Yeah, I was. I was even worried about like, is could master blaster even do this is this like part of you know like was he not yeah. trained well enough so vernon roy richards kind of whipped this up but from what i see uh he was trained fine and he um his new trainer it usually takes i, I they put him through a program mm -hmm. of getting them acclimated to their new trainer or their their new partner yeah and uh it usually takes three days they were saying that they got through it in two days and they felt like he was solid and he was already back at work so oh, uh, good boy i told you he's a good little bomb sniffer a big thank he you is. to ledger star ap news the washington post the daily press orlando sentinel and of course weekly world news for giving me an amazing screenshot to include with this story here it is for you mm -hmm. guys on youtube i'm telling you those <laughs> dinosaurs were playing chicken that's what happened <laughs> so danielle um some takeaways from this it's sad it kind of undermines police work um it know, does yeah an embarrassment to the force to have something like this well all i can think about this entire time so far is the fact that you've got all of these people that were evacuated they could have potentially struggled mentally afterwards you know ptsd people get injured just... in evacuations exactly like yeah. there's i mean the most senseless thing to me it makes absolutely no sense why someone would want to do that and how someone could value the way they are seen by others more than thousands of other people's lives that will just never make sense to me yeah yeah you know and i'm glad you think you're a hero for that and there will be people that will praise you but imagine all of the people that you just in turn are making suffer yeah and it also throws a uh, another curveball in terms of other cases because there was cases that he had worked on like there was a man named uh, thomas lee royal who was convicted mm -hmm. of killing a police officer and vernon richards worked on that case all of a sudden a new appeal comes up because yep. all this information came out about vernon richards it and him gives, planting evidence exactly and so you give all these people that could potentially very rightfully be imprisoned for what they've done a chance yeah. to get a get out of jail free card Right. It's awful. God, right. did nothing but harm everything. It's yeah, making me it's, mad. There's a ripple. There's definitely a ripple effect to that. Yeah. So. That is the oh, story. Oh, grief. That was a good one. Yeah. You brought it. 
You, didn't <laughs> you see said it coming, I have to settle you? this tie. I didn't. You, yeah, I knew. I knew I was taking you for a ride when I got when I got down to that film canister. I'm like, oh, she doesn't know which way this is going yet. I didn't. I, you probably tell by the look on my face. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Good grief. That's yeah. a disappointment. And that kid going through that. I hope that he did I get know. some kind of settlement from the city on that. That's just yeah. yeah. Yep. That poor guy. Well, it's that time of the show. We got a couple of extra stories to tell you guys about as mm -hmm. well. This whole crime and fame thing just ringing through our brains. Danielle, let's get it started with you. Okay, so I have to say this. I feel like I live under a rock, okay, first and foremost. I do. I live <laughs> under a rock. John is laughing because he knows that it's true. He's like, yeah, she's right. Um, but when I started researching this, I did not realize... <laughs> how many celebrities are also criminals? Like we know all of like the typical ones, but so that's what my extra stories are about. It might not be crimes for fame, but instead it's just famous people that have used that. You crime know what and I mean? fame. Yeah, crime and fame. It, well, that's yeah, what we'll just call it. together. Fame and crime. So the first one, fame and crime, crime and fame, all together. Anyways, so the first one's on Robert Blake. So this is a case where it's believed that fame got someone out of a crime that they committed. So six months after Robert Blake, who is known for his parts in The Little Rascals, which is just very disappointing to me, and Beretta married his wife, Bonnie. Now they went out for dinner at their favorite Italian restaurant, and while leaving, Robert claimed that he somehow left his revolver behind in the restaurant, questionable in itself. So he sent Bonnie alone to their car parked around the corner while he went back to get his gun. Now, when he arrived back at the car, he found Bobby dead from two gunshot wounds. It's so, I mean, it's already weird. It's already it's weird. It's already, you're like, wait a minute. You just, yeah. would you like just set your gun on the table at the Italian restaurant and forget to pick it back up? <laughs> yeah. So during the investigation, Blake ended up actually refusing outright to take a polygraph. He said that he was too upset at first. And then when pushed further, he said that he had dreams at one point about killing his wife, and he was worried that that was going to make him fail the test. <laughs> so authorities were busy trying to figure out what was going on. His gun didn't match the gun that was used to kill his wife, but there was also a gun found nearby that was the murder weapon. And eventually two stuntmen came forward to police saying that they had been approached by Robert who attempted to hire them to kill his wife. Now, ultimately, he ended up being charged with murder, solicitation of murder, two counts of that, conspiracy to commit murder. The list goes on. They also temporarily arrested his bodyguard that they believed ended up being the one to commit the act. But ultimately, in 2005, Robert was found not guilty thanks to his notoriety, the lack of evidence. Now, he was, however, eventually found guilty in a wrongful death suit filed by Bonnie's four children. But to this day, there is still a massive argument out there about the fact that he played some role in this and managed to use his big name and money to get out of it. It's yeah. I mean, you have to consider that. How mm -hmm. how often do we see charges that come up against famous people? and It's like weird things happen or things kind of seem to fizzle out or disappear. Um, the only yep. thing that grabs me, Danielle, is if he actually did plan that and he was asking people to participate and be part of that, why didn't he come up with a better story? Like, hey, I'm going, I forgot my fettuccine at the table. Like, oh, my to-go box is still in there. Like, why would you, like, Super don't bring believable up Super believable at that point. Don't walk, yeah. run. <laughs> yeah. Don't bring up a gun. Like, I don't know. I don't know. It's kind of Yeah. And everyone at the restaurant, they were like, we didn't see him come back. <laughs> mm. Well, that's a problem. So there's, I mean, there's a whole lot to this. I want to, it's, it's a whole thing. So. Wow. Wow. Um, well, in uh, 1984, I'm going to roll on the clock back again. Mm -hmm. I was just a, a wee kid, but I remember <laughs> the excitement as the Olympics were coming to my home state of California. Sam the Eagle was the mascot. He was this really cute cartoon character. He was popping up on clothing and merchandise everywhere. I think I got a Happy Meal or I got a little Sam the Eagle toy. Uh, and the story of a hero made headlines. Of course, security is always a top issue at the Olympics. And for the most part, things seem pretty well locked down. As a matter of fact, the mayor was saying that they were going to uh, kick back a million dollars that was given to them from the Olympic Committee for security because they were like, everything's going so smooth. We're going to give you a million yeah. bucks back. Wow. Um, but there was one instance. Uh -oh. An officer named James Pearson spotted a ticking pipe bomb in the wheel well of a bus carrying 
the Turkish athlete's luggage oh, no. at the Los Angeles International Airport. Get this, Daniel. He runs over, pulls a wire out of the bomb, and then carries it 60 yards across the tarmac to keep everyone safe. It was called a courageous act and quickly made the news. Only problem? Officer Pearson was upset about his assignment. Four days prior, he made the bomb, and then he planted it there to get attention. He would fail a lie detector test and wind up admitting that he planted the device. He got two good days of news coverage out of it. The first day, he was a hero. Literally the second day, they were talking about him being a fraud. He resigned from grief. He resigned from the police force, was given five years probation, uh, 1,500 hours of community service, and fined $10,000 on top of it. And he did it all to be noticed. You know, I keep teeter tottering between like, that's really sad, and like, what on earth is wrong with people? <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. I just keep kind of bouncing back and forth between that. Well, it's interesting because I, I think really the fame aspect is coming into play here again, yep. right? It's that same theme. It's kind of the same thought as in your story mm -hmm. where there's something that's just so important. If I do this, it will equal that. Yeah. And that's kind and that's of what happens see. here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, but it's a, it's a story they're, they're telling themselves. That's just, that's not the reality <sighs> of these situations. Yep. Oh, good grief. Well, my next one is, is something that honestly highly upset me. <laughs> Uh oh, Tim Allen. <laughs> Who? Exactly. I could, y'all. I could not not speak about this because the Santa Claus is one of my all time favorite movies. Okay. Yeah. I feel like my whole childhood just revolved around watching Tim Allen on like different amazing television shows and movies. So when I'm like browsing this article on crime and fame and stumble across the fact that, you know, in 1978, Tim Allen was casually arrested in Kalamazoo International Airport for being in possession of um, 650 grams of cocaine, I was shocked. Don't you I love was that? shocked. Don't you love that mugshot? <laughs> did you see the mugshot? I did. Yeah. 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 You guys, Tim Allen, drug trafficking, I can't. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to watch any of his movies the same anymore. I'm not. Aww. Now, he somehow did manage to weasel his way out of it. I think he had actually just started dabbling in comedy. He wasn't necessarily famous yet. Mm -hmm. But to mm -hmm. see that he went from drug trafficker. To father on your. Yeah. 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 I'm no. just interesting. Now, he handed over all the names of the dealers in exchange for three to seven years in prison instead of life. So after that, he able was able to go and be in all of the great 90s classics, which I'm thankful for. I'm glad he turned his life around <laughs> because yeah. I would be distraught. Yeah. Well, and it's okay to love the characters and realize mm -hmm. that the actors are different. The actors are different people from their characters. I learned I that the hard way. Thank you, Brent Spiner. Disappointing. <laughs> Data, Data was such a good character, Brent Spiner. Uh oh, I'm not I going know. on the Brent Spiner rant again. Look, I'm not. It's hard. Well, see, it's hard. That's what I saw Tim Allen and I was like, no, there's no way. There's no I gotta, way. The first one that actually <laughs> where I really felt that is when I was working, I was working at 20th Century Fox and we would have, you know, we had lunch down on the movie lot. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we would, they'd get, let us see a movie in advance. Like they'd give us a special screening just for employees. We were going down to a screening. I want to say it was like for and like alien resurrection or something like mm -hmm. that. And I saw um, Jim Belushi. Mm -hmm. He was wa wa walking from a set. He turned around and he saw that there was a bunch of people walking and got completely freaked out and ran away. <laughs> I'm like, dude, like, we're wait. employees here. Like, we're, <laughs> you know, we're not a bunch of fans that they let onto the back lot all of a it's sudden. Just like, hey, like, yeah, go get him. <laughs> Jim Belushi. And even if we were, like, who's going to be chasing after Jim Belushi? Like, come on. Oh, I mean, yeah, great. you're Jim Belushi, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, Danielle, what's more famous than Universal Studios? Now, any fan of Universal Studios in California knows 
there's a history of fires occurring at that site. As a matter of fact, sometimes I was wondering, oh, like, is this a like an insurance thing? Like every 10 years, I got to burn yeah, the place there's down. there's something going on here. <laughs> um, but honestly, just, I mean, when you see it's in this kind of little valley, it gets really hot there. Like, and, you know, think about the things they're building. They don't, exactly. have, to, they don't have to build them to building code. They're yeah. just a little fake wall. Uh, you know, the stuff goes up like matchsticks, apparently. But uh, the most recent one was on June 1st, 2021 when a fire started in the Despicable Me attraction. And that was actually a scary reminder of a much larger fire that happened 13 years prior on that same day when the newer version of the King Kong attraction burned down. And reportedly hundreds of master tapes from some of the greatest musicians in American history like Billie oh, Holiday, Louis Armstrong, Chuck Berry, and Aretha Franklin all wow. went up in flames. Wow. But there's another fire that occurred many years before, back in 1990. It destroyed sets that were used in the Dick Tracy movie, To Kill a Mockingbird, and oh, Back to the Future 2. Oh, you, geez. How could you let that happen? It also delayed production <laughs> it's on the Sylvester. It's a crime in itself. It is. Uh, <laughs> it also delayed production on the Sylvester Stallone film Oscar. 20% of the sets on the back lot were destroyed. It took 400 firefighters nearly three hours to contain the blaze. The original, so this is the first version of the King Kong mm -hmm. attraction, was also damaged, though it was mainly contained to the exterior building, mm -hmm. but they ran sprinklers to save King Kong. And I, if I remember right, I think he actually got damaged from the sprinklers as well. Um, but the fire, that fire, started by a security guard who had been working there less than two months, and he thought he would get a commendation for being the first to report the fire. You're joking right now. No. What thoughts go through these individuals' minds? Not many, not many good I, ones at least. I don't know, but there's, there's one thing that's just a little bit worse about this story. The studio actually contracted outside security firms for uh -huh. doing their security there. The name of that firm, mm -hmm. and I'm not joking, Burns International <laughs> Security <laughs> Services. <laughs> That's not a joke. Half uh, the time I wonder how any of these stories that we tell are real. I know, I know. Like the fact that we so frequently have to go and like triple check that this isn't just all made up because of things like that. Yeah, yeah. It's not a joke, Danielle. I'm Burns telling you, it's like subliminal messaging. <laughs> I'm serious. It's bizarre. <laughs> oh, goodness. Well... These stories threw me for a loop, that's for sure. I no longer yeah. am able to look at my favorite 90s actor the same, and mm -hmm. the list goes on and on. But to the most important part, because this has to be settled, who is going to win this month? Yeah. <laughs> we have to come back from a tie. <laughs> yeah, that person that didn't vote last month, remember to vote, vote this, this time. Month. Yeah. Please vote this time. It was probably Raylan. <laughs> she, like, it was the yeah. one month, one month she didn't vote. vote. Did I get my vote from Raylan? <laughs> I'm going to talk to her about this. But you guys, you get to vote who told the best crime for fame story. That's right. And you can vote on our Twitter account at Crime After Pod for the first seven days after the episode drops. Or you could also head to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com. You can vote there. We also have a link in the description box below. You can also click the little letter I in the corner, and that will take you to where you vote as well. At crimeaftercrimepodcast.com, you can find all the links you'll ever need, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself, how to suggest show topics, join our Patreon, or shop our Teespring store. And as always, a big thank you to our patrons. We have so much fun over there. You guys get a bonus Patreon special segment monthly. You'll get to hear my thoughts on Bigfoot and how I'm pretty sure it's just giants. There's lots. Giants. Go. I'm telling you, we talk <laughs> all sorts of crazy things. You hear yes. all the crazy inner ramblings of my brain. Yes, Learn us do. very well. And every patron gets a personal shout out at the upcoming Patreon special. So That's it's fun over right. there. Join <laughs> us in one month on may 1st for the first live recording that we're doing together i know unbelievable together for the first time from yeah. las vegas at crime con and the topic las vegas crimes i already know it's gonna be a good one i already know <laughs> i already know it's gonna be a good one too <laughs> it's gonna be great 
And I feel like there's going to be this added level of competition because we're in person. <gasps> it's probably going to make me nervous. I'm going to lose. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so serious. I'm going to be nervous and I'm going to lose. <laughs> oh, goodness, Daniel. It's, it's going to be good, though. Mm -hmm. It's going to be good. This podcast is produced and hosted by myself, Daniel Holland, and the amazing John Lorden. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. The best way you can help others find us is to tell them. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone that you love crime after crime. See you next time, guys.